actually、uh, very interesting, and it's true because the power of the mind is is、uh, just so incredible. It even talks、uh, about that in the Bible. And if you want to, I forgot the exact verse, but if you want to move the mountain, you can do that. It's in the power of the mind. And and I think uh,、um, Michel de Marquet in a public lecture、uh, describes why the Theobans have so much mind power. It's because You know we are on category one planet, which is the lowest level. So our higher higher self distributes like、uh, the electrons or the astral bodies to nine different people equally. So we get one ninth of the electrons of the higher self.、Um, the Theobans they are on category one planet. You got to accentuate the positive. You're listening to Karen Swain, teacher of deliberate creation, accentuating the positive, showing you a way to a better life. Accentuating the positive—it's not just bad; it's sanity. Who, in their right mind, would accentuate anything else? Hello, and welcome to another show, accentuating the positive with Karen Swain. Always wonderful to be with you all again. And remember, if you're liking the shows, to please subscribe and、uh, send the shows to other people. A few of you have、uh, been emailing me lately saying that you do share the show, so I do really appreciate those people that are sharing the shows. And I haven't, for the longest time, put any advertisements on any of the YouTube shows. So YouTube doesn't share my shows because you know it is a business, and they do only share shows that have ads on them. So it's up to you guys to share the shows. And today's story. Is a really, really important one. I think that some of you have probably seen Samuel. Samuel Chong, welcome to the show, Samuel. Let me welcome Samuel. Thank you for having me here. <laughs> Samuel has been on Jeff Mara's podcast, as we、um, or Jeff Reynolds, the Jeff Mara podcast, as we discussed in the last show with Jeff. And I see that you're getting, you're doing the rounds. You've you've reached out to quite a few podcasters, like you're getting the message out there. Uh, about the Thaya Uber prophecy, which is the book we're going to talk about today. Yes, we're talking about a book. There are some people that say, "Oh my God, they're just trying to sell a book," but <laughs> I guess we are trying to sell a book. But really, what we're trying to do is spread the information that's in the book because it's really important information, as you'll hear about today. Let me just tell you a little bit about what we're going to talk about. Samuel sent me his bio. It's a pretty short bio. Samuel Chong. Yes. Is a certified court interpreter and a Chinese translator who now lives in LA in the US. He was instrumental in arranging for the Chinese publication of the book that we're talking about, written by Michel de Marquet, the book "The Thai Uber Prophecy," which came out in the early '90s and was a bestseller. Michel, who was a French-born Australian, well, he moved to Australia. When he was in his younger years, is known for his book *The Thai Uber Prophecy*, also known as *Thai Uber: The Golden Planet*, and it's also called *Abduction to the Ninth Planet*, isn't it? One of the other titles for it. Yes, that's right. Yeah, someone told me about the book years and years ago, and then I had a friend who was telling me, "You got to read this book. You got to read this book. You got to read this book." And like many things, people tell you, you go, "Yeah, yeah, one day I'll have time for it. One day." Anyway, I read it finally.、Uh, Michelle was born on the sixteenth of July, nineteen thirty-one, in Normandy, France, and in seventy-one, he and his family moved to a French territory of New Caledonia before moving to Australia in February seventy-one. And, and in Australia, he purchased a five-hectare freshwater farm near Cairns and developed a farm. On which he grew vegetables commercially and ran a plant nursery while raising a small number of livestock. After selling the farm in '85, he purchased an 11 and a half hectares in Deerul, south of Cairns, on the edge of the national park. It was there that he built a home, established another farm, and was contacted by the people from Thaya Uber in June 1987. Now, am I pronouncing the name of the planet right, Samuel? Um, somewhat.、Uh, no, I, <laughs> I pronounce it as a、uh, Theuba. 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 Theuba.、Yes. Okay. Theuba. That sounds better. 
It took Michelle three years to write the book, The Theulva Prophecy, first titled, yeah, here we go, Abduction to the Ninth Planet. Further difficulties arose in selling the book as a few people, including so-called UFO experts, didn't believe him. <laughs> Still, <It's okay>. Michelle. <laughs> managed, You're happy right now. <laughs> he persisted. He managed to present the encounters and experiences in public lectures around Australia and in the United States throughout the 90s. And a guy called Tom Choco, is that how you pronounce his name? Yes, Arranged yes. lectures for Michelle in Melbourne, Australia, including uh, several at Melbourne University. Huh, so that's interesting. He did get he, the message out a little bit. Yes. Uh, meanwhile, promoting Michelle's visit uh, and arranging media interviews back in the 90s. And Michelle separated from his wife, Lena, in the mid-90s and moved to Vietnam. He lived on an island in South Vietnam, an island, he said, that reminded him a little bit of the planet Theuba. Theuba. In 2004, he married, uh, okay, N-G-A. How do you pronounce that? La. Oh, okay. <laughs> nah. Okay. Nah. <laughs> his Vietnamese wife and uh, he passed away peacefully on July 9th in 2018 well, it's very specific at 3 a.m in the morning Vietnamese local time from a sudden illness he was 86 years old seven days away from what would have been his 87th birthday he was buried on the island in South Vietnam all righty well Tell us how you've spoken a few times on other people's show, how you, um, you know, found the book and what it meant to you. But tell us again how you found the book. Uh, how long ago was it? Um, that was uh, in 2014. I was actively searching for E.T. contactee's book because since I was young, I was always looking for answers of the mysteries on Earth, such as the Bermuda Triangle, the pyramid, and also the meaning of life, life after death. Um, and um, I was um, thinking, if um, anyone could give me an answer, that would have been that would have to be the ETs that have uh, advanced civilization, because we are far from knowing what's going on, resolving all the mysteries. We need help from an uh, outsider, an ET that has a very advanced civilization. So I searched on Amazon, and I found this book, and I didn't buy it; I borrowed it from a library because I was a uh, very frugal, I'm still am a very frugal person. So I, I just read the book, I couldn't put it down. And I it really um, brings a lot of closure to all the mysteries, all the questions that I had uh, at that time. And in the postscript of the book, it says there are more incredible things that, uh, that he was not allowed to write in the book. And that really got me into finding him and to know what exactly he was not allowed to write in the book. Because in my mind, this book is incredible enough. Um, and 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 was more so, was more incredible that he was not allowed to write in the book. I was hoping that he could tell me. So I searched on the internet and I located uh, like a few websites or internet posts that uh, describe how they encountered, how they met him. And um, there was a photograph of his bungalow and I took the picture, I didn't know his exact address, and I flew to Vietnam from Los Angeles, a few thousand dollars, a big investment for me, and I gave the picture to the taxi driver and asked him to, to just to see, uh, just to take me to that picture, <laughs> the, the bungalow showing the photo, and then he took me there, a second try, I found him, and then, yeah, that's how uh, things went, yeah. You know, Samuel, for a frugal person, you've spent a lot of time and money on getting this message out to humanity. So uh, congratulations. Thank you for doing that because it's an important it's an important book. It's an important message. And um, I have a couple of questions because I've read the book. You sent me the book and I've read it. As I said to Samuel before, I, I normally don't have time to read people's books, but through some flukes and some rescheduling, I found the time. And uh it's, yeah, it's mind blowing. And one of the questions I had posed was, I wonder what else he knew that he didn't write in the book, which is something that you thought as well. Like, what else does he know that's not in the book? Did he share any of that with you? He did uh, share with me uh, that one thing that he was not allowed to write in the book, among other things. For example, he shared with me was that he strongly recommended the book 
um, Life After Life by Dr. Raymond Moody. And he also recommended the book, The Book of Enoch, because he believed that Enoch was taken by the same group of ETs, the Theobans. Um, and it really describes um, how what Enoch saw um, and uh, it matches his uh, experiences and his personal encounters. So, and he also told me a few things such as uh, the Martians, like the people who lived on Mars, uh, later went to Tibet. And that's really interesting because I find that the Tibetans, Tibetans they're really spiritual. They, they are not really focused on the material aspect of life, no matter how hard the Chinese government tried to influence them, to encourage, encourage them to, to uh, gain more material wealth. They're just not um, into that. This matches the description in the book that the, the people on Mars were really spiritual in nature. Um, he also mentioned uh, a lot of other things, such as uh, uh, the chambers beneath the Sphinx in Egypt. Uh, he says there are three chambers, and once we are ready, we can open the three chambers and everything will be revealed. And uh, But right now, it's not the time yet. Even if we use explosives, um, they cannot be opened. He also, you know, the... The first time that I met him in Vietnam, he was, uh, in the very beginning, he was very kind of annoyed at my visit. Um, but later, um, before I was about to leave, he said, uh, Samuel, can you help me to follow up with this contract? They paid me $2,000 to have the book published in China, but they never um, contacted me again. Could you please help me to uh, see if the book was published in China or not? And that was, uh, he he hadn't told me that that one thing that he was not uh not allowed to write in the book yet. So I was trying to very hard to please him. So that opportunity came. <laughs> so I really worked hard in getting the book published in China. But one thing he told me uh was that since you read the book, you know you knew the content. You know the content. He said that uh, Tao, the character, the the ET, told him that I I was going to find him. That there was young one young man that was going to communicate and talk to him so uh, about this so wow. he, he kind of knew that I was coming but when I tried to ask him more about that he refused to tell me more I asked him what else did they talk about and he said oh just just that's it that's it he just <laughs> bluffed me away and um, and, um, and he also mentioned that there are 12 families in the world that's running the game behind the scenes and I asked him which 12 he he never revealed the names. Um, I think we he, know them. I think it's <laughs> been really, revealed. Not, not necessarily, not necessarily. I did a lot of research and investigation. Not what people normally think about. No, not really. <laughs> you know, it's so, really it's a mystery. <laughs> so did he reveal them to you? He didn't. Oh, he didn't. He didn't. But it's definitely not the 12 families that people talk about. And I mean, not necessarily all the 12 oh. families that people mm -hmm. reveal. Interesting. Um, yeah. yeah, I love that he was told by Tao, who is the extraterrestrial from the planet that he was taken to, that you were coming, and yet he was still annoyed at you being, <laughs> he was a little grumpy in his older age, wasn't he? I think that he'd spent years trying to get the message out. He'd had so much pushback from humanity saying, you're crazy, you're cuckoo, as he would say. He got just, he was just over it, wasn't he? Yeah, I mean, he was extremely depressed Um, um I didn't know why I met him because he was telling me all the jokes uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought he was happy. But later on, like just a few weeks ago, people tell me that people told me that that's a sign of depression. I mean, he was trying to hide his real emotional feelings in his heart. And um, I, I felt the same way because I was trying to send the messages out. And a lot of people, even especially the people in the UFO communities mm -hmm. and the people who experienced or who did research on on, um, on reincarnation or life after death, they really didn't want to or didn't have time to read this book. So I, I, I felt the same way that he was rejected by the people who believed in the UFOs. Um, that I was know, a major turn they're, they're at such a, a, a low level of understanding. They're just like, let, let's take photographs of lights in the sky and like, look, look, there's a light in the sky, there's a light in the sky. But this book is explosive. This book goes into the creation story, parallel universe, just some of the things I've written down. 
where the planets and solar systems come from, human bacteria and the beginning of Earth, the worlds and other civilizations, you know, where different races on Earth come from and around the cosmos, you know, their technology and how they can manipulate molecules and make bodies and go goes into ghosts and the doko and uh, architecture and levitation and anti-gravitic and sound pollution in our world, colour therapy. These are just some of the things that we're going to chat about. Um, the aura, how important it is to read people's auras, asteroids that hit the earth years ago. It goes into the whole history of earth, the moon, the pyramids, leadership, the Jewish race, Moses, Jesus, anti-gravitic levitation, time travel, and finally, their message to humanity. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. So the UFO community who are stuck on looking at lights in the sky are not asking those questions, are they? Back then, I think things are changing now. But just outline for people, you know, what happened to Michelle. Yes. Yeah, so he was uh, woken by some mysterious force and he woke up in the middle of the night. He wrote a note with his wife that we gone for 10 days and there's absolutely no need to worry about me. And then he walked outside of his house. He was lifted up into the air. And then he was taken by Tao, a very beautiful race of uh, ET, a very beautiful person, nine foot tall, uh, wearing uh, astronaut clothes. Um, and um, into a parallel universe, just not to be seen by other people. In the parallel universe, he saw a uh, very strange people, people in the medieval times, and also the savages who couldn't communicate with him or Tao. Uh, and then uh, and then from there, uh, he went into the spaceship, and then uh, he was uh, disinfected using uh, yellow light and blue light. And then his uh, body, uh, there was a, a deeper um, method of uh, disinfection in which his astral body had to leave his physical body. For a few hours and then on the spaceship on the way to uh, their destination they stopped by to another planet in which uh, it was destroyed by atomic nuclear explosion uh it's a very interesting story and then um yeah he was told uh, many things like the origins of uh, the yellow people the black people we are really brothers <laughs> the yellow people and black people and the where the Caucasians uh, came from, uh, the Jewish people, and also we are all aliens from different planets. And then, and then he was told many things, uh, uh, especially the meaning of life and the importance of reading auras, like you said. And there are also important facts um, that there was life on Mars a long time ago, 300,000 years ago. And there was also alien bases or ET bases on the far side of the moon, the back side of the moon. And he was informed about the history of um, the people from Lemuria and the Atlantis and among many other things, especially the stories in the Bible uh, really shocked me. I couldn't put the book down and I really had to meet him partially because I really wanted to know more about the information um, on, on the book, uh, on the stories in the Bible. So according to him, uh, Jesus was actually uh, two beings. One born out of uh, Virgin Mary was actually someone who um, like um, was implanted into the uh, uterus of uh, Virgin Mary and um, they inserted the embryo. Uh, that Jesus couldn't perform miracles because he forgot the knowledge of uh, doing the miracles. Um, and they did that just to create this kind of um, uh, effect so that people believed that the baby Jesus was someone special and he was the Messiah. Uh, he later went to India and went through China and died in Japan. So there is a tomb of Jesus Christ in Shingo village, Japan. The Christ, on the other hand, who could perform miracles, was actually one of them. Uh, they actually um, went inside of uh, another body created by the ETs that looked like the Jesus who went to Japan. And uh, that Christ could perform all the miracles like healing the people and uh, resurrecting the dead 
and do all the levitations and materializing or shape shifting. He, he did all the miracles just to show that he was uh, someone really, really powerful. And he died on the cross and resurrected three days after just to show people that there is life after death and there is reincarnation. But yeah. somehow the councils of the church and the Catholic church removed the concept of reincarnation. And uh, the book specifically named the five different church councils that intentionally distorted the original accounts in, in the Bible. Yeah, I wanted to talk about it's one of the um, points that I've got written down. I wanted to talk about uh, the Jesus part of the, of the book because it's um, it's quite explosive, um, especially, you know, the virgin birth. There are so many people who have been discussing the virgin birth over the years of Jesus, and most of them say it wasn't a virgin birth. But when you do think about, and we've had a lot of discussions on the show about alien, the hybrid hybridization theories and there's so many women that have come out and said that they weren't necessarily virgins but that they were pregnant that without having had sex you know at the time they got pregnant and um, so immaculate conception is possible if you think about it coming from an et race where they take your body and you know implant you with um, an embryo and of course we you know you don't have to actually have had sex you can be a virgin now today with our technology and be implanted with an embryo so the whole virgin birth story seems very feasible when you think about it like that right but mm. I wanted to say to you that years ago in the Seth books uh, channeled information through Jane Roberts in the 60s have you read any of those books yes I read them yes well, Seth said that the story of Jesus was actually about three different prophets. He said three, that the story that we have put into one story from up throughout the Bible is actually about three different people, three different prophets that walk the earth. And so this is talking about two, two different, you know, one being an immaculate conception in that his body was DNA altered and then put into the human body. But what was really interesting, because I've always held this question, what's what creates the veil what creates the veil like what creates the forgetfulness i think you use a different word for it what do you call it the river of oblivion the river of oblivion that's just so mm. beautiful the river of oblivion i love that what creates a river and it has something to do with the dna our structure our body structure so you said or michelle said or or they said Tao said that if you create a human body through the, a birth this the consciousness is still under the river of oblivion so it doesn't remember you know who they are as spirit or who they are beyond this world but if you create a body from scratch like they created a body out of the molecules i don't know how they created it but they created a body that had a completely different dna structure it doesn't necessarily go through the river of oblivion and he had full memory of who he was, is, was as a spirit and higher civilizational being or what we've called extraterrestrial. Yeah, so he had full memory. I think that's fascinating. And he could do the what we call miracles, which is what their race do on a regular basis. No miracles to them. It's just normal living, right? Levitation, yeah. walking on water, you know, turning water into wine, manifestation do you want to talk about some of the other things that that Tao and his race can do and that Jesus did and yes uh, besides levitation they can also communicate through telepathy and they could also like uh, shape shift and shrink their body and make their bodies bodies disappear and they can also just uh, use their mind to achieve a lot of the miraculous uh, things and, and Michelle told me that uh, when he was on the planet Theoba, he asked Tao several times that, teach me how to levitate, teach me the things that you can do. And he asked them several times and there was no response. <laughs> and they were just uh, laughing or smiling at him. And, and he really get a, get a, he really didn't get an answer. And he was uh, kind of uh, very disappointed by that uh, in the sense that he knew that they're not responding to him was a way of telling him no matter how we teach you you are just not able to do that so he was extremely disappointed um 
Yeah, me too. I I wanted to levitate too. But actually, you know, after I, in the process of spreading messages in the book, I had a few people contacting me, uh, saying that they were able to levitate when they were young, and they did uh, certain things uh, using their mind, just uh, connecting their energies. Uh, from this is the, uh, the the main two meridians and make it into a circular motion and they relax and they were able to levitate and I found that to be fascinating and, and they could see uh, all rest too yeah. another thing I was trying to do was to find people who can see all rest who can see the energy field the human energy fields I was uh, trying to follow the uh, suggestion written in the book trying to develop our aura, aura camera. I just need more people to come up to me, to contact me. Uh, if uh, you can see um, the colors of the human energy field, the auras, please let me know. I just need more people so I can have more data so that I can come up with the algorithm. I think I'm almost there. I just need the, to have more data so that the artificial intelligence can, can, work, um, can work it out better. There's a lot of people that claim that they can see auras and um, I can see auras, but I, I see white. I see the aura as white. I haven't yet seen it, the different colors. So as I'm reading in the book, they were saying the, the, the Ubens, tell me again how to pronounce it. The Ubens. The Ubens, the Ubens. They were saying how important it is to be able to read other people's auras because you can literally know what they're thinking by the color of their aura because their demeanor or their state of consciousness is represented in the different colors in their aura. And um, apart from being telepathic and reading their mind, you just have to glance at someone and you know exactly where they are because you can see the color around them. I thought that was really interesting. Uh, what, what was I going to say? Was well, something else that you said about, oh, levitation. Yes, even they said the... The Ubens said that levitating for them was an effort and they had these different apparatuses that allowed them to um, fly through the air, I guess, levitate like a little hovercraft, like a little hovercraft. Um, because I think Michelle had asked in the book, why don't you just levitate? And Dale had said, oh, because it actually takes a lot of energy to do that. So even for this highly, highly evolved civilization, it was still a lot of effort for them to levitate, right? Yes, yes. And that's very interesting. And they can only see ahead, like 100 years ahead of us. I mean, within 100, they cannot see more than 100 years uh, far apart. Uh, I find that to be very interesting because uh, they cannot really see the future that far out. Uh, and it really indicates that we can change the future. We Absolutely. need to act together to make the future better. So this is why I have also have a scholarship, <laughs> a better <laughs> world scholarship for anyone who reads this book and writes an essay and and uh, and do something about it. I think uh, I'm trying my best to have to make a contribution. <laughs> okay, so you've created a scholarship, uh, a better world scholarship. And you're asking people to read the book and write about it. Is that is that right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, every year one, that? Yes, every year one person is selected uh, for the uh, essay or for an action that he or she did to make the world better spiritually, especially on the spiritual aspect. So uh, this year, the award went to a lady in Taiwan uh, who uh, invented uh, like uh, apparatus to reduce the noise in the cities in Taiwan. It's actually a noise camera that captures uh, the noise levels of different uh, areas. And uh, by doing that, um, the people who make a lot of noise are sent out a warning or, or a ticket uh, <laughs> and so that people can pay attention to this matter. That was something they else they discussed in the book is our noise pollution and how we're so oblivious to the noise pollution on our planet like traffic noise and then we go to rock concerts and they ramp up the sound and how damaging it is to our ears and even our vibrational frequency it's it's literally the pollution is literally harming us something that we don't realize as humans what we're doing to ourselves right yes and, and i asked a lot of people who could see auras um asking the effect of noise on the on the people's auras and they say um they could see the changes on uh, the people's auras if they're surrounded by loud noises. 
Um, and I also contacted contacted uh, a lot of the uh, noise reduction or noise pollution organizations, and and to see if uh, there's anything I can contribute. Unfortunately, they are all kind of uh, not into this book. You would uh, think that they would be interested in this book because they have they share the common goals. Not necessarily. This is what I've been finding out. The people you think that would be interested in this book, uh, they, they don't necessarily, <laughs> they're not necessarily open to this. Uh, I know, darling, like Michelle, you've got your work cut out for you because you've taken on his legacy and you're spreading the message in this book. But I have to say, unlike Michelle, you are living in a different world because I've been doing this for over 30 years, showcasing new old teachers and having these conversations. And the evolution of this conversation has exponentially expanded over the years, especially <clears throat> in the last 10 years or even the last couple of years. So you've got an easier job than Michelle, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there is a collective consciousness thought form that says, if you believe in aliens, you're crazy, which has gripped many people still, you know, even people who are aliens or ETs or, you know, who are star seeds, we call them star seeds. They still hold that, oh, I don't want to talk about ETs or aliens because that's crazy stuff. You know, they still hold, it's a collective, it's, I think it's been purposely put into the unconscious collective to stop people evolving and um, and taking back their sovereignty and taking back their powers of creation and and knowing who they are as powerful creators like the Dia Ubens, no, De, De Uben, I'm never going to get that name right, am I? But I've written down quite a few things I wanted to talk about. We've talked about a few already. I think you got into the parallel universe uh, and the Bermuda Triangle. But first I want to ask you, we'll talk about those. Where is the solar system that the planet it is? Is it the what we call the Pallades? Um, people suspect. People made some kind of conjectures or guesses uh, where a field by is located. Some people say it's located near uh, the Pleiades. Uh, I have no idea. I, I never asked because to me, that's actually not the, as important as the messages contained in the book. Uh -huh. That one thing that Michelle told me and asked me not to reveal to anyone else. But I have given out a lot of hints on that point. But but the location, I don't know. <laughs> Well, I say that because you speak you speak about the creation story and the Black Australians and where they came from, and the they believe that they can't that it comes from the Pallades and that you know I've just come back from Uluru, which is the rock you know what was known as Ayers Rock, in the centre of Australia, and um, the Indigenous elders say that it's actually a part of the Pallad like the Pallades a planet a planet in the Pallades system that will. In, during the creation story came to earth and 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 slammed into earth went into the earth like a sperm would into the ovum and created life on planet earth and um yeah and the, the thea ubens sort of talk very much about being a part of the creation story very much a part or maybe they just are talking about the history do you know much about that I think they were just uh, talking about the history of uh, where the black people and yellow people came from. The, uh, and, and I think uh, it's very interesting that they they told the stories about the pollinations, <clears throat> which came from the planet Arimo X3. And and they uh, established, established the uh, Lemurian civilization on the continent of Lemuria. And then some of those people went to Atlantis and colonized that continent. So I found that to be fascinating. And um, I, I think um, given the fact that, that this book contains a lot of uh, specific and verifiable facts, uh, such as the tomb of Jesus Christ in Shingo Village, Japan, and the disappearing uh, needles in space, and also a few other facts I mentioned in the book, I would believe 100% written in the book, even though there are certain facts written in the book that are not yet consistent with the conventional wisdom. Uh, one of them would be the moon. Um, we now, the scientific community, believe that the moon is um, moving farther apart from us by, I think, uh, four centimeters per year away from us. But this book indicates that the moon, sooner or later, in about 200,000 years or so, would uh, strike the Earth, fall down to the Earth. So I think 
that that's uh that's very interesting i would believe this book because uh when i reached out to the people who did the measurements of uh, the distance between the earth and the moon they never got back to me um i asked a lot of people like five different groups five different major leading scientists I found that to be uh, fishy because <laughs> because uh, if they don't have anything to hide, they would have gone gotten back to me. I mean, yeah, interesting, isn't it? Yes, I, I can't remember what it said about the moon, but it talked about millions of years ago there being two moons, wasn't there? And an asteroid hit the moon. It talks about that, doesn't it? Yeah, there were two moons long time in the past, uh, but then um, but then something happened, and then we only got one moon now. Well, you see, this this is cooperation or collaboration with um, someone I've had on the show, Garnet, who is taken out of his physical body into his astral form and flown around the universe and given all this information to give to humanity. He's now written five books. Uh, so Michelle is not the only one that's um, bringing this sort of information like this to the world. Um, and he said that uh, that there were two moons, like he was told by Albert, his spirit guide, that there were two moons. Millions of years ago, there was another moon or another planet orbiting the earth that had life on it. And it was hit by an asteroid and pushed out into the, uh, into space and then exploded and is now part of the asteroid belt in the, in the universe cosmos or wherever the asteroid belt is. But he said, before that happened, the ETs took the life off that planet, the fauna and flora and put it on earth. And they put it in guess where Australia. And so our kangaroos and wallabies and platypus and all these animals that we have, including plant life uh, that is nowhere else on the planet, came from that second moon. So mm. that so it was interesting because I had, when Garnet said that, I had never heard that from anywhere else. And as I say, I've been doing this for like 30 years. And then mm. I read it in the book and I'm like, there it is. Yeah, not exactly the same story, but the fact that there were two moons orbiting Earth at one point. Yeah. And another uh, specific fact about this book is about the importance of the number nine. So if you, oh, yeah, the number, the number nine is uh, has a lot of significance. The number nine. The number nine, yes. Mm -hmm. Nine different categories of planets. And also the fact that uh, we have uh, the astral body and 81% of electrons uh, when we die would uh, leave the body after, after and after three days would go to rejoin the higher self and, and the other 19% floats in nature and uh, become ghosts <laughs> until 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 the person reincarnates. Uh, something like that. It's, it's uh, okay, <laughs> okay, let's stop at this point because that's something that I've got written now. I wanted to talk about ghosts. So in my online group I call the Inner Sanctum, one of my participants' daughter had said last week, what's the difference between, she'd asked this question, what's the difference between a ghost and a soul or a spirit and I said great question how old is she she's like 12 or something she's thinking about this stuff don't you love it and um, I said so funny that you asked that question because I've just read something I'd never heard before in the book so do you want to talk about the ghost yeah sure ghosts are the 19 percent of electrons that remain in nature uh, when a person dies uh, and then it remain they remain in nature until the person reincarnates into another physical body. And uh, during this time, the ghosts or the electrons, because of static force, they shape like the person who when the person was alive. Uh, so it's, it got the same shape. And then electrons also have memories. So it got the memories of the person when he was or she was alive. So the ghosts, made of the electrons frequently visit the places that they hated or loved. And so this is why you see a lot of um, stories like haunted houses. They, they're they real, they're true. <laughs> they're just electrons. <laughs> and, and there's nothing to be afraid of them because um, they're just 19% of the electrons. And if you really don't like them, you can just uh, light a candle or maybe a lighter. And um, because the electrons react to to the fire, and they, they go away when they meet fire, so so that's a very easy way to get rid of the ghosts. Okay, so you said that nineteen percent of the electrons that make up the physical astral body. So obviously, the physical astral etheric there is 
maybe nine different levels of bodies that incorporate in a physical structure and in this and then after death obviously the electrons or molecules that made up the physical body disintegrate into back to the earth and then there is 19 percent of the astral body that stays behind is that what you're saying that creates a ghost and you said until you reincarnate what happens when we reincarnate so we when we reincarnate so a part of the 19 percent of the electrons that float uh, in nature would uh, rejoin the astral body of the newborn baby mm -hmm. uh, along with the 81 percent of the electrons from the higher self the 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 astral body um like 81 percent of the astral body um that go to the higher self and then come down to the new baby uh, to the astral body of the new baby along with a portion of that uh, um, Nineteen percent of the electrons in nature, uh, and then when there's a difference, the higher self uh, sends out additional electrons to make up uh, for the difference. So that is one hundred percent of the electrons. So that's that's a very complicated uh, uh, explanation, but but I think uh, it's it's really interesting. That's the way nature is. <laughs> Okay, so I can hear people saying, what if you don't reincarnate back for thousands of years? What happens to those electrons? Did they just hang out in, you know, as ghosts until you come back thousands of years later? Yeah, sometimes uh, the electrons hang out in nature for a long, long time. Sometimes they join, they rejoin to other uh, like things, for example, like other, this is just my conjecture. It's not reading the book, mm -hmm. nor did Michelle tell me, but I'm just thinking that maybe they rejoin other like uh, animals or plants or, or other or other people. And this this is actually um, something that I found out that Michelle DeMarquet wrote about it, the 19% electron in another book that he wrote uh, called Nature's Revenge, when he talked about astrology. So um, he says in that book that astrology works uh, to a limited extent because the uh, not necessarily the planets, but nature has a certain pattern. So the patterns affect the 19% of electrons that stay in nature. So it's the 19% of electrons that have certain um, personality or character characteristics um, um, if they are rejoining uh, the new baby at a specific time, because over time, um, like like at a specific location, at a specific time, there's a specific character or personality um, for the electrons. That's why, uh, to a certain extent, people who are born at a similar location at the same time will have certain similarities. And that's uh, portrayed by the astrologists, astrologists, that's that's they were the effect of the locations of the planets, but not necessarily exactly a pattern of nature. It's just a part of the universal law. Part of universal law. So, what is the difference between? I've heard it called before when somebody else explained what ghosts were. Because you said they are 19% of the electrons of the astral body left behind, but they contain memories. So I've heard it called thought forms, that ghosts are thought forms. So they're forms of thoughts or memories. They're in a form. The memory creates a, a form. It's not actually a soul. So what is the difference between a soul, you know, that part of us that leaves the body that rejoins our higher self or our group soul, and and the ghost what's the difference um they're all made of electrons mm -hmm. and uh, the the book doesn't really talk specifically about the differences but i would assume that the 81 percent of the electrons of the asteroid that uh, joins the uh, the higher self uh, contain more memories about uh, like how we uh, evolved us uh, spiritually in this lifetime and it contains valuable spiritual lessons. I mean, uh, I would assume that that would be the case. And the other 19% would have memories about specific facts uh, or certain events that happened. 
uh, that are not really recycled into into the uh, higher self. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. As I'm asking the guides, <laughs> as I'm asking you, they're telling me that, um, you know, they said that the Egyptians called the soul the car body, spelled K-A, and it is a container through which consciousness can experience a specific um, experience or environment and um, that there are containers that just like a car is a container that we drive around on earth. It's like the body is a container and the astral body is also a container that the aspect of your higher self or consciousness uses to traverse an experience or a dimension or a place, I'm trying to put it in words that make sense to people. Um, yeah. So it's a contact, it's a container. So yeah, interesting. Does that make sense? That's what mm -hmm. they're telling me. They're, they're yes, going yes, into yes. it in more detail. Mm -hmm. I can talk about that later. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've done ghosts, other worlds. Let's talk about parallel universes and the Bermuda Triangle. So the parallel universe that he went into initially was kind of like an anomaly. And he said that it was over the Bermuda tri Triangle, that if you get sucked into it, you can get stuck. It's outside of time and space. So he saw, as you said, people that were in other times that were stuck in this parallel universe, but they had no idea that they had been there for thousands of years because they, there's no concept of time there. Is that right? Is that how it works? That's right. The, the time stops in a parallel universe and people over there don't feel any pain and they don't die unless uh, someone uh, calls them to die. So it's very interesting because uh, I, I I don't know if you know this, uh, there's a guy, a writer in the U.S. called David Pilatus, and he wrote a lot of uh, cases in which people just vanish in national parks in the U.S. He documented a lot of strange and very strange and weird cases in which people just disappear. Sometimes uh, when they're walking a group and then when a person turns uh, his head back and then the person just gone, disappeared. They couldn't locate that person uh, anywhere else. And, and that just happened like a few seconds ago. And, and I found that to be very interesting because it could explain, I mean, the parallel universe theory could explain a lot of uh, his uh, missing 411 cases. And uh, there's also another very, very interesting fact. When certain, like a few weeks later, when the corpse of the person who who went, who got, who went missing was found, and a lot of times they found a lot of uh, very strange injuries uh, or wounds that a regular person just wouldn't have done, wouldn't have done to, to him or herself. Like, uh, just as uh, if that person didn't feel any pain. So this book specifically talks about that the people in a parallel universe don't feel any pain. So I found that to be uh, fascinating because the two unrelated books match each other. But you say parallel universe as if it's, a, yeah, like because uh, Garnet, for instance, has experienced and other people have experienced other parallel universes which are not like that. They're just like Earth in a, you know, but that something else happened. Um, like the movie Sliding Doors where there is this other timeline of Earth, like you make a decision and then it creates a different reality. Or if you make another decision, there's a different reality. So there's a parallel reality simultaneously living out in a parallel universe. So that's what the way parallel universes have been described classically. But in this book, they're talking about this parallel universe, like this anomaly, this sort of time anomaly where people get sucked into it. And it's got something to do with the Bermuda Triangle. What do you think? What is that? I think uh, Bermuda Triangle is just one uh, classical example because it's the most well-known one. There are a lot of other different uh, locations uh, on Earth okay. that parallel universes exist, especially where, you know, uh, David Pilatus, I have to credit him because he documented all the cases and marked on a map where most people went missing. Uh, and then those are normally like places in national parks in which the latitude the attitude is high. And um, so you can imagine parallel universe is just like a sphere floating around in the atmosphere. 
and they change their locations depending on the time. So um, it's like a portal. When someone is near that portal. floating uh, sphere, uh, then the person got sucked into that. So it's, it's a yeah. physical phenomena. Yeah, it's like a portal into an anomaly, like a, yeah, an anomaly. I don't think we've got words for it. I think parallel universes is as close as we can come to it, but uh, we need to create new words for this stuff, you know, in English. Mm -hmm. I think the English language is very limited in its descriptive quality of what we're trying to talk about. But yeah, a lot of people have said also that what happens in the Bermuda Triangle and again on the opposite end of the um, earth in the same latitude, longitude is the anomaly from underwater ET bases that are using portals to traverse the universe. And so they're creating these anomalies where if you if a plane flies into this vortex, it disappears out of this universe and goes, you know, sucks into another parallel universe or that anomaly of the parallel universe where it's stuck in time yeah it's also fascinating isn't it samuel <laughs> yes yes and actually when translating this book this is the most challenging book to translate i bet we got a lot of uh, very interesting uh, new concepts, concepts. And new yeah mm. translating it into chinese yeah absolutely yes um human bacteria and et cleansing so when he got on the craft they cleansed him with yellow and blue light gee we could use some of that down on earth couldn't we <laughs> yes actually i wrote an article about it <laughs> two years ago when everything happened and i i tried to use my uh, knowledge from this book to uh, tell people that uh, we should start doing research on the effectiveness antibacterial antiviral effectiveness of blue light Right. People didn't pay much much attention because it doesn't cost anything because it's right. very cheap. Well, exactly. The pharmaceutical industry is not going to make money from it, are they? So they're not interested in it. Yeah, because this world's run on money. Yeah. But blue light. Well, another corroboration, you know, in the in the Casa in Brazil, where John of God once did all these amazing healings before he went to jail for, for sex offense. Anyway, that's another story. They developed this light system and you would lie on these light beds. And of course, the doctors just poo-pooed it and said, ah, oh, it's just ridiculous. But they said that they were given this knowledge from higher civilizations, that um, it was a healing. It was a healing thing using colored lights. So there you go. Yes. Yeah. Everything is about vibration. Even uh, Nikola Tesla said about it. And, and I think Einstein also mentioned about it. If you think about it, if you just use your gut feeling or common sense or intu intuition, bacteria is larger than viruses. So mm -hmm. viruses are actually more affected by different vibrations, which in turn are can be made through different uh, kinds of uh, colors of lights. And so, so are sounds. I do believe that certain sounds have uh, therapeutic effects as well, especially towards um, certain very infections. And another thing that they talked about, color therapy. And one of the reasons they said for knowing the color of your aura is how you wear clothes. It's important to know what colors to put on that will benefit who you are and how you feel do you find that when you get dressed in the morning that you are quite specific about what colors you put on your body or do you just get dressed just not thinking about it just put on whatever no i did uh, some experiments on myself i dressed because michelle de Marquet said that my aura color is blue uh, is uh, green so i tried uh, different kinds of blue greens and i felt uh, a little bit uh, differently but but i'm very insensitive in a lot of ways so i didn't feel that much of an effect but i do think that color uh, colors have uh, therapeutic effects uh, there's a there are actually a lot of uh, people who did a lot of research on chromotherapy, uh, the the therapeutic, therapeutic treatments using colors. And I found that to be uh, very fascinating because they don't really cost a lot of money. Uh, being a frugal person myself, I like to try those ways. <laughs> I keep emphasizing that, but then, <laughs> but wait, how? Hey, I mean, uh, we are facing a financial crisis down the road. I mean, it, it doesn't hurt to know some of the uh, inexpensive and cheap ways to 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 heal and to get uh, treatments. 
<laughs> being a frugal person as you are uh, so why are you frugal Samuel it, are you worried that um, you just said that we're facing a financial crisis down the road is that something that is because of you're looking at statistics is that something that Michelle and the Thea Ubin said or you know this is uh, something about me I always combine um, or bridge science with spirituality I also take a great uh, interest in researching and investigating realities. I majored in economics from UC Berkeley and studied economic history in um, the University um, School of Economics. I also studied financial analysis from University in Spain. So I, I, I know the financial world. And also being a Chinese myself, I'm privy to certain information from China by the whistleblowers uh, from the Chinese government or or certain people from China. So I can access a lot of information that uh, an average English English speaker wouldn't normally um, be able to access. So what the uh, what we are happening what 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 is happening right now around the world is that, that my home country, the government is doing a lot of uh, things to to make a mess. Um, unfortunately, it's my home country. It took me a long time to believe that or take that because it's my home country. But but truth is truth, fact is fact. It is true that um, they're still doing a lot of terrible things around the world. If you look at all the variances, um, some of the early variances just disappear. And, and here come out the new variants and new variants and new variants. And where do they come from? Are they just naturally evolved or naturally muted? It? It's impossible. A lot of scientists say it's not possible at all. They had to be intentional, like uh, intentionally kind of done. So, so they're doing a lot of evil things over there. And, um, and they're also trying to create an economic turmoil. Uh, they hold a lot of US debt, uh, the treasury bonds. So a lot of factors, when you, when you combine everything together, um, when they make a move, is going to be felt in the U.S. and also in other countries around the world. So I'm saying this because whenever throughout history, if you look at history, whenever the governments or the Fed, central banks try to increase the interest rates, uh, two years or three years down the road, uh, economic recession always follows. So it happens many times in history. I don't think it's going to be any different uh, this time. So I'm preparing psychologically to your audience to be prepared for economic downturn or a recession. Uh, try to learn how to be frugal, uh, try to be more economical in a lot of uh, different ways, and try to get as much information as possible about from alternative media, not from the mainstream media, because uh, they always try to cover up something. I mean, uh, it's just the way it is. Okay, so I was going to ask you, what would you be your advice? But I think you just gave it to us, be, be more frugal. Uh, I, I once, years ago, many years ago, dated an Indian man. It was before 2000 and he was trying to stay in the country and he, he went to the embassy to see, you know, what was happening with his um, passport. They ended up deporting him because it was during the year 2000 when the Olympics happened here and they just, like, said, denied because the immigration office was just too busy to think about whether he wanted to stay. But anyway, he came back with these statistics and he said, did you know that one in every four people in the world is Indian and one in every three is Chinese? So do you think that's true? That was 22 years ago. Do you think that's uh, still true? That was true uh, 20, maybe 20, more than 20 years ago, but no longer true anymore. Because no longer true. The population in China is, is, no, is not 1.4 billion. It's 1 billion, less than 1 billion. Okay. So China, yes, our... our China have a because they had a one child policy, so they reduced their population. Is that what the key, happened? The key is the the Chinese the, the government of my country. Um, they don't necessarily report the truth. Okay. Um, statistics uh, from China cannot be relied on. You oh, have to okay. look into other like uh, other means to find out uh, the population, and also, for example, some people. Look at uh, the electricity usage of China. Some people look at other things, uh, and and just uh, you just cannot believe or cannot trust the um, the government of my home country. I know, it must be sad to hear that you can't trust the government of our country either, darling, or I I suspect the United States. But shh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> anyway, let's talk about healing. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> let's talk. I think most people who are watching this show know that. Let's talk about healing. Healing of the Latoli. Now, what was that? What's the Latoli? Do you remember in the book? L A T O L I. I've written it down. Anyway, they have the ability to regenerate their bodies and cells at will. And this is an excerpt out of the book. As I was just explaining to you, this is Tao talking. We have the knowledge. We can revive the dead, cure the deaf and the blind, make people walk who are paralyzed. We can cure any malady you care to name. We are masters, not of nature, but in nature. And we can do the thing most difficult of all. We can generate life spontaneously, which is what I was talking about with the Jesus body that they, you know, they can make a body. Do you, do you want to expand on that? What you know of yeah. that? Yes, I remember. Yes. This is actually uh, very interesting and it's true because the power of the mind is, is uh, just so incredible. It even talks uh, about that in the Bible. And if you want to, I forgot the exact verse, but if you want to move the mountain, you can do that. It's in the power of your mind. And and I think uh, um, Michel de Marquet in a public lecture uh, describes why the Theobans have so much mind power. It's because, you know, we are on category one planet, which is the lowest level. So our higher, higher self distributes like uh, the electrons or the astrobodies to nine different people equally. So we get one ninth of the electrons of the higher self. Um, the Theobans, they're on category nine. So their higher self doesn't distribute the electrons to anyone else. It's just all the electrons of their higher self is incorporated into their physical body. So they have a lot of, they have uh, nine times more electrons than we do. So they have so this kind of nine times more mind power than we are, we have. So that's why they are able to use their mind to do a lot of uh, miraculous uh, things. So I think um, a lot of people on earth can do similar things, but not to that extent. For example, a person I know down in Los Angeles in Orange County, she can really materialize medicinal powders. She has x-ray eyes. She can see the person in front of her, uh, the internal organs of that person, and see what's, what's really going on inside of them. And she can actually just um, um, transform herself into another state and then just uh, use her mind to, to materialize uh, medicinal herbs for a specific uh, symptom or disease. And, and there are other people who can do that. Uh, there is also a monk in Nepal who could uh, levitate using his mind. A uh, magician in the U.S. Uh, named Dan White uh, visited Nepal and made a documentary film on that. He is a magician himself, but so when he saw the monk levitating, he couldn't figure out how he did it because it's not done by the conventional magic. <laughs> So I think uh, it can be done, and uh, when we progress and we when we evolve and we have more when we have more mind powers, we can do the same thing. Yeah, I agree. There's been many gurus and teachers who have obviously come from these higher civilizations, or they've got more electrons in their body, or I don't know what 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 it is. Like there was Sai Baba in India who would manifest what was called vibhuti, which was like an ash. And uh, he would manifest jewellery. Skeptics would say that someone was passing him rings from behind his back and he was giving it to the audience. <laughs> I've met many people who went to Sai Baba back in the day and uh, they have their pieces of jewellery that he manifested for them. Another, um, There is another Indian guru in India who is a male and he calls himself Ama. He says he's the feminine energy incarnated into a male body. And he's doing the same thing. He's manifesting jewelry and giving it to people. Most people are skeptical about it, but I guess that if you've got more electrons, you can do it, right? Yes, yes. Uh, a lot of healers in the U.S. Um, can do that too. When they see a person's aura, they can see the uh, abnormalities um, of uh, uh, certain areas um, on a person's physical body. 
they would use their mind to recover, to make uh, that area of the RS more normal. Um, so this is all using their mind. So I think the mind is very powerful. When when one person meditates and gets into a certain state of mind, uh, that person can actually do it. I, I think it's, uh, it's fairly interesting. Yeah. And as far as regenerating, rematerializing um, the physical body, like they did with the second Jesus, uh, in the book, I was talking about this, you might have heard me with Jeff, you know, in the book, you organize an um, autobiography of a yogi that um, Yogananda, who the book, who wrote the book, his his guru, Sri Rukteswar, after he died, came back to show Yogananda, who was still physically incarnate, that he could reorganize the molecules and come back in a physical form. That And Yogananda touched him and hugged him and like felt him as physical. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's out there, this information, even though it is out there, it's mm -hmm. it's also written in other books. And um, what was I going to say about you? Yeah, Garnet, who I was telling you about, his spirit guide, Albert, appeared to him physically as a homeless man. And again, Garnet had the experience of touching him and having a physical experience with another human being. And then Albert explained to him afterwards that even though he was physical to Garnet, Nobody else could see him. And I thought, how do they do that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, how's that done? You know, there's so much stuff that we don't understand as puny humans, isn't there? Yeah, mm -hmm. we've got a long way to go, Samuel. It's fascinating all the things that happen. Isn't it? Yes. <laughs> I was really curious and really into the people who have uh, such extraordinary uh, supernatural abilities. I was actually actively searching to meeting those people. And, but after reading this book, I just, it's just normal. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have that fascination anymore. <laughs> okay, I've gone through bodies and ghosts, the DOKO, the DOKO, D-O-K-O. Mm -hmm. it, it's what he experienced when he reaches the planet, he sees these egg-like structures. He said most of them were on their side, so like a dome, like a, half an egg, and then some of them were sitting up as if the egg is going up. So it's not exactly like a circle. It's like an egg. Do you want to mm -hmm. explain to us your understanding of the DOKO? Yes, uh, DOKO is actually made using a very, very subtle force uh, that uh, everyone has. Um, and they use the nature and that subtle force uh, to create this kind of um, a dome-shaped uh, um, kind of energy field. And uh, when a person comes into inside this uh, doko, um, and the person would be able to see outside, just as if um, there's uh, nothing, there's no wall, uh, it's just uh, transparent glasses. But uh, the rain, when the rain uh, falls down, they would uh, meet the energy field and they would uh, part their ways. And so this is a very, very interesting structure, building building structure on that planet. Um, and I think uh, we should, uh, if we have the uh, technology, we should uh, imitate that because it's convenient, it's uh, environmental friendly, and it's uh, fascinating. I was thinking as I read that part, you know, this is their ho this is where they dwell in these docos, right? This is their homes, their mm -hmm. their architectural structure. It's it's an energy force that looks solid from the outside, but then you can just whoosh, pass through it as if you would be passing through a wall. Mm -hmm. And um, where do you hang your paintings? They're obviously not going to be paintings. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. <laughs> anyway, you don't know that, but. Um, <laughs> What I found fascinating about this, again, some more collaboration, this is what happens with 30 years of experience of talking to people, is Penny Kelly speaks about in her book, The Robes, she speaks about a future Earth and she speaks about a technology that we have on Earth. It's only about 200 years in our future from now, an energy field that we put over our gardens. She said that everyone lives in more, more community, not like in big cities like we have now. We've moved into communities and she called them family communities. Um, yeah, communities. And um, there are small communities and large communities. And each community has what is called the kitchen garden. And they create this force field over the kitchen garden that creates an atmosphere, which is always perfect for the plants to grow. And I thought, wow, that's cool. We could use that now, right? So we're not dependent on the weather 
or the pesticides for, you know, to keep the aphids out and mm -hmm. keep the birds eating your crop. It's just a force field, like a see-through force field that has its own atmosphere and it creates a perfect, yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's exciting, isn't it? What's to it's come? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right we've done color therapy perceptual reading the content of moo do mm. we want to talk about that do you want to talk about what's said about moo and uh, easter island yes the continent of moo was the pacific ocean uh, in the past it actually sunk fourteen thousand five hundred years ago um, and that continent uh, was uh, uninhabited until the people from Arimo X3 um, wanted to migrate to Earth. Uh, they were looking for different planets and they uh, found Mars, but Mars was uh, didn't have a lot of resources for them. So they came to Earth and they really liked Earth a lot because uh, it's, the continent itself was uh, almost empty. Um, and uh, except for a small group of Chinese over there, they fought against the Chinese, although they didn't want to, but the Chinese being suspicious, you know, the Chinese people are really suspicious. I can testify that. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, it's uh, really um, not a big surprise that they fought against the, the people from Arimo X3. And so they, um, after that, they didn't really want to cause the turmoil. So they established a base on the far side of the moon to migrate slowly uh, from their planet to the base on the far side of the moon and then to the continent, to the continent of Lemuria. They were highly evolved people, although they're also, they were also on um, category one planet, but they, they really, had a lot of uh, technology such as the anti-gravitational technology or supersonic vibrational system to build uh, a great pyramid, which is three times the size of the Great Pyramid of Egypt. Uh, they, they had the knowledge of uh, using the Great Pyramid, uh, using the pyramid to capture cosmetic rays or cosmetic energy to communicate with uh, people from other planets. They could also use the pyramid on the continent of Lemuria to make rain. Um, they also built the statues on Easter Island just to commemorate the people from Theoba because um, at that time the Theobans were in contact with the people on Lemuria, helping them to colonize other parts of the planet. And um, because they were spiritually evolved enough to be able to to do certain things. Unfortunately, uh, the continent sank because of uh, earthquake uh, caused by the gastral spells beneath the continent. And, uh, and and because they also kept their knowledge, their secret technology, their technology is secret from other people on Earth. So the technologies were, were lost as well. Um, and And when the uh, continent of Atlantis also sank, um, and and just uh, there was no record of uh, such technologies existing on Earth, but the remnants of the statues on Easter Island and the Great Pyramid of Egypt, and a few other historical um, monuments in South America or in India. Yeah, and recently, I don't know how recently, it could have been in the last 20 odd years, they started digging down the the statues on Easter Island and found that the heads that we see, which I don't know how tall they are. Do you know how tall they are? Maybe 10 foot, maybe 20 foot. Anyway, they're big. Yeah. They actually go down about five times bigger into the earth and they're like full body. You can see these bodies that, um, have you seen that? Yes, I actually visited Easter Island. Oh, did you? I did, I did with my family. And I actually tried to bring such knowledge to the local people. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, people, it's really sad in a way that the people on that island were kind of uh, not as open to the spiritual knowledge as I expected. Yeah. Except for one guide, one English speaking guide which I still have contact, her contact. And I sent a book in Spanish to her because the people, it, it was an island 
belong to Chile and they speak Spanish on the island. Okay. I uh, happen to speak some Spanish too, so that's very interesting. <laughs> so, wow, you are a Pandora's box of knowledge, Samuel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, how long ago did you visit there? It's, uh, I think, uh, four or five years ago. Okay, so quite recently. Yes. Quite wow. Recently. Yeah. Anyway, you can read more about it in the book if you want to know more about it. We won't go into everything. Now, I've written, I've got a couple of excerpts here. Uh, this is interesting. This is out of the book. What really renders me speechless, so this must be Michelle speaking, to the amusement of my friends, which were the Thea Ubens, Thea Ubens, I still can't say it right, was the sight of horses bearing heads of very pretty women, some blonde, others auburn or brown, and even some with blue hair. As they galloped, they would often soar for tens of metres. Ah, yes, in fact, they had wings folded back against their bodies, which they made use of from time to time. Something like the flying fish would follow. They lifted their heads to see us and tried to rival the speed of the uh, lativoke, that 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 apparatus mm-hmm. that makes it what's mm-hmm. how do you say that I, it's just the way you pronounce it lativoke La, Lati, mm-hmm. which is their the opera apparatus that they used a little thing that they held in their hand that could they could travel like the hovercraft sort of thing right yes yeah the beautiful horse woman i, I found that to be fascinating because they speak the a very kind of like a human-like language. And I think uh, in some of, uh, I have a very vague memory in memory in some of the um, ancient uh, ancient civilizations, uh, some of uh, the human, half human, half animal like uh, creatures were drawn on some of the walls. So I think uh, that's, that's uh, Kind of a very interesting fact that uh, we probably had uh, those uh, creatures in the past or animals in the past or half human, half animals in the past, but they they were uh, just extinct. Ex- ex- they went extinct because of the um, earthquakes or volcano uh, volcanic activities. So unfortunately. So you think these cre- creatures existed on Earth as depicted in our? my stories that are called mystery not, or, not uh, myth. exactly not exactly the same kind of uh, creatures but similar creatures mm-hmm. there's a very interesting chinese book um the direct translation is the mountain sea scripture shanghai jing the mountain sea scripture which writes about all the strange animals and plants that a person uh, saw from visiting a remote place and some of them really match the descriptions uh, written in this book ah yeah beautiful yes yes it's it's just Mm -hmm. mind-boggling isn't it to think Mm -hmm. that what we have called myth could actually be a real creature like even the unicorn that's not so mysterious it's just a horse with a horn on its head but you know, that it had ma- magical powers and what we know as fairies or leprechauns or all this stuff that has now been put in the box of myth and storytelling are actually real creatures that existed once um, on this planet and that still exist on other planets. Yes, especially it talks about the dolphins. Um, the dolphins are really smart um, animals and we really need to be friends with them and uh, really to protect them from harm, any harm by human activities. I really Mm. love the dolphins and really Mm. they have emotions, they have uh, high intelligence. Mm. We really need to protect them, please. They have larger brains than we do. Yes, yes. (laughs) They're probably much more intelligent than us in many ways. They probably all communicate telepathically as well. but the apparatus, the thing that I can't pronounce, uh, the Lativok, Lativok mm-hmm. uh, thing, recently when I was away, we did a big walk up a mountain called King's Canyon. I said to my girlfriend, I'm so unfit, I'm not going to be able to do it. And then I decided to do it, which was probably not the best decision. But as I was walking down the mountain, Samuel, and like every step was hurting at this stage, it took us five hours to do the walk, 
I was thinking, why can't we just, you know, like have some sort of apparatus that we put on our shoes, anti-gravitic app, and we can see this mountain without having to walk it. And I was dreaming of this, of this thing that's in the book. I was like visualizing it and seeing myself flying into all the crevices and up and, and looking from above and then diving deep. Like I was having this image of me on this upper. And then I came back and read this book and there it is in the book. And I'm like, they've got it. Do you want to tell people like exactly how it works? Yes. Um, they have like a control handle that they uh, they can hold on their, in their hand and they can control the movements of that um, apparatus. Uh, they function like uh, they new first they neutralize the gravitational force using a specific vibration. So the vibration neutralizes the what they call the cold magnetic force of the earth the uh, gravity. And then they use another force to move this uh, apparatus around. Um, interestingly enough, I know that the US government, at least the US government has this kind of uh, anti-gravitational -gravi technology for military use. It's not open to the civilian use yet. Um, and <laughs> it's just the way it is. I mean, but actually I think uh, there are some scientists that already uh, invented certain things that could neutralize uh, the gravitational force of the Earth. Yeah. But yeah. It, 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 I can't it. wait for that. Like, I, I, I've said this many times on the show before. When I was a kid and I used to watch the Jetsons, because I'm old now, you know, um, that I used to think, when I grow up, we're going to have flying cars. You know, we're going to have these little spaceships and we're going to have... And it didn't happen. <laughs> it's like, it didn't happen. So, yeah, I wonder if it, it'll happen before I leave this earth or maybe I'll just live to a very old age. I was so, thinking about the oil companies. If we have uh, those kind of uh, technologies or apparatus, uh, um, the employees uh, working for the oil companies would be out of their jobs. Right, exactly. So that's not the main thing, but the shareholders are going to be the, the ones that's mostly uh, hurt yeah. by this technology. It's this whole money system that has held this world back. You know, the people that are profiting from the from the old technology, like I cannot believe that we're propelling our vehicles with petrol still all this time later, like still, and that we haven't created, you know, even electric engines are like so ancient technology compared to what's available. And as you say, the US government has been sitting on it for probably 70 years because they um you know back engineered stuff from crashes back in the day mm -hmm. yeah. and also i want to uh see if any of the audience wants to take the challenge of uh, breaking the hydrogen and oxygen bond of water using a specific vibrational frequency uh, it has been done in the past because normally people just use uh, electricity to uh, break apart the hydrogen and oxygen bond. Um, but that's not a very efficient way of doing that. If they use a certain vibration to loosen or to use that to make a, some kind of a, a resonant effect so that the bond can be e easily um, broken, uh, it's going to be a more efficient way of uh, extracting hydrogen, a form of energy for our use. So okay. how do you create this vibration through sound or? You can just use that. There are a lot of ways to do that. It's just um, a matter of finding the right frequency mm -hmm. uh, and using that frequency to break the bond. It, it, it can be done very easily. And people have done that. There's a guy, I think, uh, uh, Stanley Meyer. Stanley Meyer in the U.S. once invented a car that worked on water they used mm -hmm. water as the energy source mm -hmm. and actually what he did was exactly the same way using a specific device to generate a frequency that breaks the hydrogen and oxygen bond mm -hmm. and then he uses the on the uh, hydrogen as a source of energy yeah originally he was assassinated he died he was assassinated that's yeah that's a common story people that have invented you know, they've been inspired from their higher selves or f through higher civilizations to actually invent these things. And then the, either they're sold out, they the, some oil company will buy it and shelve it or they get assassinated. Yeah. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. it's a common, common story. Something that Foster Gamble talks about a lot in the Thrive. Um, have you seen the movie Thrive, the second movie Absolutely. Thrive? Yeah. I, I really admire his courage. The way to do this, uh, I have to mention Dr. Stephen Greer. No, I know some people don't like him, but, but I like <laughs> him. In Why do you he say that, Samuel? I know some people don't like him. Why do you say that? <laughs> <laughs> because there are people who uh, with uh, different opinions to me, uh, because I was trying to uh, to to uh, talk on certain aspects, uh, but he doesn't want to read this book, The About Prophecy. I mean, he just doesn't, Stephen want doesn't want to, want to read more. He doesn't want to read it because uh, he he thinks he knew everything already. Wow, oh, that's arrogance. Uh, I'm sorry. Really? Somebody contacted me. Somebody <laughs> I had on the show not so long ago contacted me. I don't know few months ago and said something like he's been taken over by the bad side they've got to him they've got to him you know he started off with good intentions but then he sold out he sold out that's what their opinion was so i don't know one one thing about him i'd like to mention publicly is that uh uh, you know the crop circles Mm -hmm. um i i think they're created by the gray aliens the gray aliens according to the author um, michelle de marquet they come from category one planet, same level as ours. Um, even though they have this kind of uh, technologies to come to our planet. Yeah, this is another. another yeah, but which gray aliens? But, but, because there's so many. There's so yeah. many that, you know, in what we call, it's kind of like saying humans are all the same. And you look at the variety of humans, but um, we're all category one. I know most of us. But, you know, which gray aliens? Because they're, they're, Okay, so there are many different races that are of different categories, I'm being told. Yeah. The so gray, I think he, they're talking about a specific type of gray aliens, yeah. The greys who that uh, had the crashes in New Mexico mm-hmm. um, a few decades ago, and the greys who implanted certain devices on people on Earth. Uh, Michelle de Marquet mentioned this in a public lecture in 1995 saying that the Theobans Tau told him telepathically that he could release it, this information. That is a fact that the grace implanted or had some kind of implants on people on Earth, but not that many, only 150 or so, for the purposes of monitoring our activities and how and monitoring how we respond to our um, increasingly um, problematic immune system because they all have they, they also had the same problem of um, their immune system uh, has been decreasing every year so um, same with ours too so they want to see how we respond to the same situation because our immune system has been decreasing uh, every year since 1948 so the grays are actually a dying species so back to the crop circles so I think it's the grays um, that created the crop circles uh, because I saw there was a, like a picture of the grays on the crop circles. And then back to Stephen Greer, Dr. Greer, when he um, per- gathers his uh, C5 events, he plays the music that was heard when the crop circles were formed. So in a sense, uh, he was playing the music of the grays. The grays, according to Michel de Marquet, um, they're also on category one planet, same level as ours. So they're not that far advanced or far evolved compared to us, uh, even though they had uh, probably better technologies. So I think for me, I'm going to keep an open mind. I'm keep going an open to, mind. But uh, yeah. again, th- through talking to people on the show and their experiences with the greys, I've had quite a lot of people on the show who've had experiences with the greys. You know, up on the ships, they have that same technology as the Thea Ubens in that they can dematerialize and rematerialize their bodies at will. Um, so th- there are some that are really advanced, you know, and uh, yeah, um, I'm thinking if they're category one, what happens with category two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight? You know, what's happening there? And if the Thea Ubens are category nine, like what's happening in between one and nine? That's a very good question. And <laughs> uh, and Michelle doesn't know uh, a lot about it, except the fact that the Jewish people, the Hebrews, came from Category 3 planet. Category 3. Category 3. Okay, so, let's talk about that. That's something I've um, 
I've got <laughs> written down the Jewish race, the Hebrews came from a planet called Hebra, a race from the Urba star system, a more advanced category planet around 12 thousand years ago human beings left the planet hebra in order to visit the galaxy in search of new planets of the same category of their own for they knew that uh, in the millennium to come their planet would become totally uninhabitable Uh, but they didn't find a category they found earth so they came to earth so they were a higher category and then they crash landed or they came to earth do you want to tell what happened yeah, it was an accident. They crashed on Earth. They were not looking to locate or relocate to, to Earth. So it's an unfortunate accident. A group of uh, people from Hebra kind of landed on Earth uh, near, uh, like in southern Russia, I believe. And so they uh, met the savages on Earth. And the savages tried to get their women. So they had to kill the the. Um, the people uh, on Earth, a few people on Earth, and then they moved south. And then there was some kind of uh, also like other accident in which uh, only three uh, people from Hebra um, survived on Earth. So that's actually kind of uh, like the start of uh, the Hebrew people. And something else it says in the book is this is why they're very strict on Jews only marrying and procreating with Jews because their DNA structure supposedly was more advanced than your average human at the time. I think that that's probably not so much true now, but anyway, they still believe it and they're very strict at, you know, only marrying and procreating with other Jewish people um, because of their advanced DNA structure because they came from a different category. Because I have a lot of Jewish friends, (laughs) even Mm -hmm. ones that say, oh, I'm not that religious. And, you know, they had dated, you know, women, they had dated a lot of non-Jewish people, but when it came to getting married and having children, no, they had to be Jewish. (laughs) 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 So it still exists very much in their uh, way of thinking that they have to marry other Jews, many of them, not all of them. Mm -hmm. And also it says in the book that Moses was not Jewish. Do you want to tell us about Moses? Yes, um, according to the book, Moses was a highly spiritual person because originally he, before he reincarnated, he came from category A planet. He was born um, in an Egyptian family and he loved the Hebrews and at that time. Uh, and then um, a lot of the stories recorded in the Bible were true, except for the fact that uh, when when Moses led the Hebrews out of Egypt, and when the Sea of Reeds were parted, the Egyptian soldiers didn't follow them. So this is one mistake in the Bible, and um, so no Egyptian soldier died. Another mistake in the Bible is that uh, uh, Moses actually was born uh, kind of like a, a very good uh, Egyptian family. He wasn't like a baby found on uh, on the river. It's a very good story, but uh, according to this book, that's not uh, the fact. Um, and then parting the Sea of Reeds was done by Theobans, this group of ETs. And uh, they uh, went to Mount Sinai um, they wandered in the desert for about four years or so, not uh, 40 years. And a lot of the things written in the Bible about Mount Sinai was true, but there's one fact according to this book, the Messiah was coming. Um, Well, according to them, the Messiah had come already. They indicated that the Messiah was, was actually Moses, who already rescued the Hebrews from Egypt. So that was a kind of a mistake that passed on to history, that people were waiting for the Messiah to be born. And then they used that uh, expectation to have um, the two Jesus appear. Uh, interesting. I wonder if the third, if the, th- yeah, you know how it said in the Seth books that the story that we know is the story of Jesus is actually um 
a combination of three different prophets that walked the earth or three different advanced beings that walked the earth. I wonder if one of them was Moses or anyway, who the other one was. He said there were three. So we've got two of them. Mm -hmm. So Jesus was an alien. I've always known that. I have always known Jesus was an alien. And I asked my guides where he came from and I got the Pallades. I didn't get much detail, um, but I got the Pallades. That's why I wondered if the the Uber was in the Palladian star system. Um, maybe they just gave me that because if they gave me the name of that their star system, it wouldn't make any sense to me. So it was just the closest star system. Because, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, when giving information to a mind that doesn't understand, you've got to put it in a way that they understand. And that's the way guides speak to us as well, as um, which is something that I think that you're experiencing trying to speak to people that don't understand, especially people that don't haven't read the book and something that Michelle experienced as well when he was trying to explain to people what he experienced and our minds just couldn't understand it. Yeah. So Jesus and Moses were aliens. Love that. Anti-gravity and levitation. We've talked about, we've talked about the Lashiliac thing and the Tara. The Tara was another apparatus that was um, for anti-gravitic, um, propulsion around the place so they didn't have vehicles apart from their spaceships they didn't have vehicles that traversed the planet like planes and things like that we have they just had this anti-gravitic thing that they sort of stood on like the I don't know yes. um, they, they had this kind of uh, uh, device handheld device they also had this kind of uh, like um, you know the magic carpet Oh, yeah. the magic carpet. I forgot yeah. about the magic carpet. Yeah, tell us about the magic carpet. <laughs> so Michel de Marquet wasn't able to fly or to um to navigate that device. When they took Michel de Marquet to different places, they had him sit on kind of like a I'll say like a magic carpet, kind of like a, 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 a thing. <laughs> and then they, they showed him. Uh, the different trees, the different oceans, the different mountains, and and also different places on that planet, and uh, I think um, that's uh, that's very interesting. And and there's one one detail in the book. Uh, Michel de Marquet mentioned that uh, when he saw other people on the planet, there was no sense, there was not a single sense of false modesty, in the sense that people were naked on the beach without feeling embarrassed. But when they walked, like doing other things, they had clothes on, they had clothes on. So this made me think that there are really kind of uh, people that are kind of like very, very, I would say, uh, practical. They, 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 they're, they don't have any sense of false modesty. So that made me think, like, do we really kind of, uh, I mean, do we do we want to learn from them or something like that? <laughs> well, yeah, we could all learn from them, couldn't we? But also they're all beautiful. <laughs> they're all yeah. nine foot tall and perfectly shaped. So they're not shy or embarrassed about their bodies like us humans who are all sort of come in many different shapes and sizes, fat, thin, too fat, too thin, you know, like old wrinkly they're not old and wrinkly they're just perfect so i guess that that maybe helps i don't know they can recreate their bodies at will i guess that vanity is not something that they even get into because yeah anyway it's a it's a very different world isn't it um mm. yeah something else i wanted to say about the doku too that i found interesting that i was uh reading this morning that when the night fell uh, Teo said to Michelle, you know, we have no lights because we're able to see in the dark as perfectly as we're able to see during the day. So we have no need for lights. And I thought, oh, wow, isn't that interesting? But he would have experienced darkness, but they had no lights that they could offer him when the darkness fell. Yeah, that was interesting. Yes. You know, we have infrared cameras or um, kind of uh, telescopes. And an infrared can distinguish uh, objects in darkness. So I would assume that the Ethiopians, uh, their spectrum of vision is uh, wider than ours. They could see the infrared spectrum of... Um, well, of like a vision. cat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
you know, mm-hmm. he can see in the dark. And uh, mm-hmm. I, I once saw this little, I don't know if he was Chinese or where he was from, this little boy that had the same eyes as a cat that he was able to perfectly see in the dark. And just like a cat's eyes or other animals, when you shine a light into it, you know how they glow? When you shine, mm-hmm. they sort of, they glow in the dark. Mm-hmm. He had those same eyes that glowed in the dark. So I'm thinking the the Ubans have that same ability to be able to see in the dark. Um, yeah. But the little boy said that it did, the harsh sunlight did hurt his eyes. Uh, he was more comfortable. He always wore glasses and a hat because his eyes were very sensitive. But um, all right, we're going to try and wrap this up. We've got through a lot. We've got through a lot. Uh, time travel. What do you want to tell us? What do they know about time travel? So they knew that the U.S. government had been trying to develop a time machine. This book was written in the late 80s, and and it really made me think about uh, the Philadelphia experiment that the U.S. Navy, I think it's the Navy who tried to um, hide a hide a ship using a certain um, a certain frequency, um, and uh, and then something happened. So it's documented in a lot of um, books. So they are trying to help the U.S. government to develop the help mach- the, the time machine by saying that they should really try to match the vibrations, not the frequencies. So I find that to be very interesting. They're helping the U.S. government to develop a time machine successfully. Um, But in terms of time travel, they say that uh, when a planet is formed, there is a cocoon that travels at seven seven times the speed of light that records everything that happens on the planet. And if a person with practice um, can match the vibration of that cocoon, the person would be able to travel back in time and to see what happened um, in the ancient past, just like accessing the Akashic records. So this is what was said about time travel in that book. What about traveling forward in time? Can you travel forward in time if you match the vibration? Uh, it doesn't really talk about that, That's but cool. my my conjecture is that my guess is that uh, we can see the probabilities of what's going to happen in the future, just like the psychics uh, who have this kind of gift to see the future, but it's not fixed. The probabilities are probabilities. It's not fixed. No. Yeah. Exactly. And psychics often see, like I was just talking about before, parallel universes. Like I first experienced this when I was 18. I went to Hawaii with some girlfriends and we all got a psychic reading in the market. And a few years later, quite a few years later, one of my girlfriends says she didn't believe in anything psychic because the reading she got that day was that she was going to die young, a violent violent death. (laughs) And I'm like, wow, that was a pretty shocking reading. Imagine being told that. But at the time, she used to date gangsters. You know, she didn't have father figures. She had grandfather figures. She was 18. She dated these men that were in their 60s, and they were gangsters. And one of her boyfriends was shot down in the street. And after that reading, she changed her ways and married a a nice man and settled down in the suburbs and had kids. So there was a parallel reality that that psychic was seeing, and then she made a different decision and she changed her life. Yeah. So it's not fixed. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I had uh, two psychic readings down on me in the past. Mm-hmm. Uh, both of them said I will be working on a book, a book of significance. Uh-huh. At, at that time, I, I just didn't believe it because uh, to me, not even the Bible was a book of significance. Uh-huh. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so you had more of a scientific mind rather than a religious mind or a spiritual mind in those days, Samuel. Yes, yes. But this book really shifted your perceptual experience, right? Because you went more into looking into biblical stories and without just dismissing it all as silly because it wasn't scientific. It's kind of opened you up in many ways. Yeah, because uh, this book is different in many ways from the New Age, the uh, New Age books. Uh, this book has contains a lot of uh, specific verifiable facts, um, and and it's just uh, amazes me how specific this book is. Yeah, um, 
And it's not like a lot of other channel information. It's very vague, very general. This book is specific. Yeah. Well, I've got to say, Yogananda's book, Autobiography of a Yogi, well, that was very specific. I read yeah. that many years ago. That came out many years ago. And there were things in that book that I just couldn't wrap my head around. And the Seth books too, I remember I've said this many times on the show, you know, throwing the book onto the other side of the room because it just like was blowing my mind and I couldn't digest what I was reading. So there are our spiritual books that are out there that is, is is informing us about this stuff. But for the most part, we're not ready because we don't understand. Yeah, it just hits our logical, critical mind and we just palm it off as as fantasy. Yeah, but uh, things are changing. More podcast shows like this. Got to get you on more podcast shows. Okay, so the final thing we're going to talk about is the message that Michelle gave you the second time that you went to see him in Vietnam that he wouldn't give you um, the first time when you asked him what else he experienced. Uh, he knew that he didn't write in the book. Do you want to share with us what that message was? Okay. First of all, when he told me about the message, he was uh, very serious, extremely serious. He, there was no joke at all. He told me about the message within five minutes after me uh, after we met just as if uh, if we waited a little bit longer something would uh, have happened to him or me that the message would uh, have been lost and the message was uh, very specific just like uh, the other facts written in the book and um, he told me not to reveal any not to reveal uh, he told me that Tao um, didn't want him didn't want anyone to to know this message except for him, and but he was allowed to tell me about it. Um, I can give you a few hints uh, without revealing the exact message. Remember that in the book, because he read the book, I can tell you, you can relate to it. Michel de Marquet was hurt. He was hurt by Tao, a very loving person, a person with unconditional love. He was hurt because Tao, I think, pinched him on his shoulder so hard that he yelled in pain. So why did Tao do that to him? Because it was a very important moment. She wanted him to remember the messages said to him by the Torah. And if you really read into the messages of the Torah, they say that they're really like the guardians, like the mentors, mentors to us. They help us, they guide us, but also at certain times, they discipline us. So there was something about them that they really uh, disciplined us in the past, such as the uh, naive priests in Africa. If you remember that story, they saved the three priests who would listen to them, and they killed the other nine. And there were 12 priests in Africa at that time who were uh, like kind of like a group of cult or organized religion and trying to take advantage of the people uh, so that the people couldn't evolve spiritually. They also destroyed the cities of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah because the, two, the people in the two cities were kind of like setting a very bad example to the people in contact with them. I did some research because they destroyed the two cities, not because of sodomy, but because the people in the two cities punished the, the good people who helped the poor. Um, you know, very, very severe and very, very um, heartbreaking way. So when you see cancer cells growing in your body, what would you do if you were a surgeon? Uh, would you just let the cancer cell grow or would you just um, take them out? So this is the reason they took the two cities out. They destroyed the two cities. Uh, so it's really up to us. This is why I'm so kind of like using the word desperate to spread the messages of the book out, setting up the scholarship and uh, going on shows like yours, as well as different, many other shows, trying to let the people know that this book is a book of warning. We need to mend our ways. 
we need to really look at uh, what's happening around the world. Because uh, this is a very important message. I mean, they're like parents to us. Um, I think it's better for us to mend our own ways than having a parent teach, uh, like teaching or disciplining us. <laughs> so I think uh, we have to do our best to learn how to evolve, how to grow spiritually. Well, this message has been a message that has been um, spoken uh, to me by many people on the shows and personally. It's it's not a secret uh, that just like Atlantis, that we're back at the precipice of where we were in Atlantis, that our technology has overtaken our um, our, our, our consciousness technology the technology of our stuff has overtaken the con you know the consciousness that we need to evolve spiritually in order to keep up with the technology because the technology itself will destroy us and greed and if we don't unify if we don't unify but then i can hear people saying well it's all very well you know, we're evolving as a human race. We're watching podcast shows and reading books and meditating and evolving our spirituality. But the people who are in charge of this world, the governments, are not. So um, how do we get that message to them? Like even Stephen Greer, who is, you know, seen as some sort of leader, which we didn't go into leadership. That was something I wanted to talk about. But, you know, he doesn't even want to read the book. He thinks he knows everything. That's the thing. When you get a bit of power, you think you know everything. We've got to keep learning. So what what would you say to that question, Samuel? How do we get this message to the so-called leaders of this world? I think we have to take advantage of the power of inertia. We have to take advantage of the power of the people. The leaders are afraid of the people. They are afraid of the people voting themselves out, voting them out. So um, I think uh, we have to gain the momentum and to get as many people uh, together as possible to act together. And to the financiers, we can also borrow the idea of um, started from Gandhi, the nonviolent resistance. And if we have a concerted action and um, have a kind of like a strike-like activity or action, um, then we would lose very little and they would lose the most. So they would uh, cave in. And, and I think that's the idea. Um, and I think uh, my motto in life is uh, learn from the best and know everything there is to know. And I have been learning and from the masters of uh, in, in different industries, like Warren Buffett in the investment industry and a few others in different industries. And this book, I think is the best book to uh, to really get into and to, to learn from. And I think uh, I'm going to be uh, doing this for the rest of my life. Yes. Well, thank you for your service to humanity. I want to read something just out of the book about leadership because um, he was being taught about leaders. And um, I think Tao was saying that the high figures receive no great material benefit for leading their nation. It was their vocation to lead and they did it for the love of serving their country and their people. This avoided the problem of hiding opportunists amongst the leaders. And that's something that, yeah, you know, the human ego, even when you go into politics or into a place of power with all good intentions, you know, the ego gets a hold of you and you start thinking you're better than people. <laughs> Like we see it all over the planet with leaders of countries and rock stars and anyone that has some sort of power, they start amassing material gain and material wealth and planes and houses and holiday houses. And they think that that's what life's all about instead of actually what the job is, which is about serving the people. Yeah. So that's anyway. Right. One day, one day, hopefully one day before we leave the planet, huh, Samuel? <laughs> that will be the um, reality in this world, that leadership will be about service and not about fame. Yeah. Thank you for your service. 
thank you thank for you. doing what you're doing. I honor you. <laughs> I honor <laughs> you for spreading the word and uh, I'll send you to some other podcast shows to spread the word as well and tell the people to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. It is actually available. Uh, you know, you can buy it on Amazon and Michelle's son gets the proceeds for that. Uh, and also um, Samuel was saying that when you buy it on Amazon and do a review, the more people that purchase the book on Amazon and the more reviews, then the more Amazon shows it to other people. So amongst the many millions of spiritual books that are out there, it doesn't become such a pin in a haystack. It becomes more widely seen. And that's another way of getting the message of this book out to people. Um but it is available. Someone has uploaded it with a very bad robotic voice on YouTube. Uh, if you want to listen to it on YouTube, but buying it and putting a few cents behind it and doing a review does help spread the message. So, um, so hopefully people that are listening to this and reading this, they can do that. And I'll have the Amazon links on my webpage where I'll have Samuel's um, podcast on all different platforms. Thanks again, Samuel. It's been just Thank such you. a pleasure. Thank you. Well, what did you think of Samuel Chong? He's a fascinating guy, actually. We had some more chats after the show, things that we can't talk about on certain platforms we were discussing because uh, he kind of went into it a little bit. But, um, you know, censorship, censorship, shh. But anyway, he told me some fascinating things and he's going to send me a link to another fascinating book that, yeah, he did. He translated for somebody, <clears throat> which sounds fascinating. But I'm going to get him. I said I'd like to get him back into the inner sanctum probably next year, and uh, you know, you can meet him and quiz him because he's a wealth of knowledge. He's a you know, he's a wealth of knowledge, not just about this one book. He's a wealth of knowledge about many things, and um, the fact that the Thar Uban said to Michelle that there would be a young man that he would meet. It was all predestined, wasn't it? It was all arranged. He's probably a higher spiritual being himself. He's probably one of them. What do you think? Maybe, maybe not. But, uh, yeah, it's interesting how we have this, you know, when he starts talking, like, I've always been interested in this stuff and I read a lot. Of, you know, when we have this interest in this stuff, it's 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 for a reason. It's not just because you find it interesting. It's There's a reason that you have an interest in things, anything. Yeah, it's part of your soul's plan, your soul's destiny and who you are. If you're watching podcast shows, and I know many of you say to me, you know, uh, I had an email from someone yesterday saying, I've been watching you for over 10 years. I'm like, wow, that's dedication. That is dedication. <clears throat> yeah, I've been on for over 10 years. Uh, yeah, if you're, if you're obsessively reading books and watching podcast shows about this information, afterlife, in psychic, extraterrestrial life, higher civilization, dimensions, ascension, multidimensionalism, all this stuff, if you're interested in it, there's a reason for that. It's not just because you find it interesting. You're here to make a difference to this world. You're here to spread the knowledge, make a difference, get out there and spread the knowledge and transform the consciousness of this world. I mean, the a last message that we spoke about was that if we don't transform our consciousness and shift what we're doing in this world, then, yeah, we will explode. I've had many people on the show, even um, Lorna Byrne, who was a kid and the angels were showing her probable futures of Earth and a lot of destruction, like this world was being destroyed, much like Atlantis, because our techno our conscious technology was not caught up with our technology technology and we had the ability to kill ourselves um, and rape and pillage the planet with our pollution and all this sort of stuff. So expanding consciousness and unity and love is the most important thing you can do with your life, really, over your career, over your family. I mean, yes, have a career, love your family, have fun, make money, whatever. But expanding your consciousness uh, increasing your spiritual abilities, your spiritual journey is the most important thing you can do as a spirit, having a human experience. That's what we're here for. We're here to experience this physical world, which includes all the things that's here, you know, love and hate and taxes and sex and <laughs> marriage and relationships and all of it. We're here to experience it. But it is a spiritual journey. Physical life is a spiritual journey. <laughs> there isn't physical life and spiritual life there is only spiritual life which encompasses this physical life 
So increasing your psychic abilities and your love quota and feeling unified with all beings, not just human beings, all beings, feeling unified with the earth, with the trees, with the animals, with everyone, even the people you disagree with or that you hate, with the politician that you disagree with, feeling love and unified is you expanding your spiritual journey and raising your consciousness and raising your vibration. And when you raise your vibe, you raise your ability to take back your powers of manifestation. It is the most important thing we can do. It is to remember to be deliberate in how we think and feel. And when we hit that disagreement or that hate or that unrest, clean it up in the moment as you experience it. Why am I feeling like this? How can I change it? What can I think about? That makes me think about this in a way that feels better. That's the work we're here to do. Raise your vibe. Oh, just look at the clock, 12, 12. Thank you, guides, for making me look at the clock. <laughs> they, love, they love it. All right. Okay, I'm not going to say too much more because it's been a really long show. But I will have Samuel back. He's lovely. He's beautiful, isn't he? Lovely. There's so much to talk about. Read the book and join us for a conversation about it in a couple of months. And I'll see you all again soon. Uh, yeah, this weekend, Kimberly Meredith's coming up for some readings and healings. She said she wants to do some readings and healings with the group. Lots of people have been emailing me saying you want to join. So if you want to join on Zoom, see what she's up to, come along. And uh, check out the show I did with Kimberly. She's been on many shows. She's got a rather large following. She's very active in getting herself on podcast shows all around the place. She's, you know, passionate about spreading her healing message, which is great. And so she's coming into the inner sanctum this weekend. So join us. Um, this will actually be up probably just after or just before she's coming in. So you might be watching this after it's happened. But the recording will be on the website and on the platforms. I'm now on Odyssey and Rumble as well as YouTube and many, many different audio platforms. So thank you again for listening and watching. I love you all. Remember, check out the book Awakened by Death. If you haven't already, I'll have to write another book soon and I'll catch you next time. Bye for now. Thank you.